There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have a seating chart. We can't call on anybody. This hurts. To live to destroy those things. Good morning. My name is Peter Kahn, and I think I know many, many or most of you, but uh, class of 76 here at the law school and practice law in Washington, D.C. at Williams and Connolly. I must say, when I was asked to moderate this panel, I was a little nervous that some of my partners may have suggested it. Uh, but uh, in any event, there does come a time when, uh, sooner or later, that all of us begin at least to think about uh, whether we want to continue to practice law forever. Um, you know, um, the original uh, title of this was going to be, um, Do You Really Want to Die in the Saddle? We, <laughs> thought that, we, we, we thought that might be too much of a downer. <laughs> so the question is, you know, whether you're thinking simply of a career change or ultimately retiring, there are obviously many issues that one needs to think about and consider. And so we thought uh, we would uh, open that up for discussion this morning. Uh, it's, we always sort of put this off, but maybe it's time we all sort of gave it some thought, at least for an hour. So uh, it's um, uh, my pleasure to introduce the panel, which is uh, quite excellent, we think. Um, Heidi White uh, from the uh, uh, Duke Medical Center, uh, Jean Carter, uh, now with McGuire Woods, and David Tarshish uh, from Seattle, now with the ACLU, or? Northwest Justice Project. OK, close enough. <laughs> um, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Their full biographies are here. Uh, for you to read, and we hope um, this will generate a lot of questions and discussion. That's, that's our ultimate goal, to have some, some thoughts, and hopefully some of you may have already made this decision and can, can enlighten those of us who haven't. So with that, Heidi. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Heidi White. I'm a geriatrician here at Duke, and I'm really glad to see so many of you out early this morning <laughs> to talk about, you know, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, but uh, I'm going to have some slides this morning, and I think they're coming up on the screen shortly. Um, we're going to talk, I'm, I, my topic is healthy aging. And um, as I Think about that juxtaposition of words, healthy and aging. Um, there's a little bit of uncomfortableness in that. And I think that in geriatrics, we have a little bit of a message. You know, we, we are a young specialty in this country, and we're still thinking about our message. What is our message uh, today? And, you know, as I've been thinking about this with uh, various groups like the American Geriatric Society, um, I've come to realize that it's not just geriatricians that are struggling with this. It's a lot of folks. If you think about this topic, the CDC here in this country likes to talk about healthy aging. Uh, the 
WHO, the World Health Organization, likes to talk about aging well. Um, this man, uh, a very wonderful photograph of an older adult uh, by Alex Harris, a documentarian here at Duke. He's pondering the issue in my imagination. And uh, so we'll, hopefully we'll have some discussion today about what healthy aging really is. Um, scientists think about, like to talk about successful aging. Um, the problem with successful aging is it means some people are not successful, right? <laughs> and we'd all kind of like to be successful at this. So in, from a scientific point of view and a research point of view, there's been some work done to think about what are the components that mark people who are aging successfully. So I thought I would start there. What are the components? And the first one, um, as you might imagine, is to avoid disease and disability, okay? And so <clears throat> think about uh, your, your own family. Um, have your parents uh, been able to avoid disease and disability? I would say it starts now. <laughs> um, it starts with some healthy habits, such as not smoking. I work here in Durham at Crowsdale Village Retirement Community. Crowsdale is a continuing care retirement community, and it's made up of a lot of retired professional people, a lot of uh, Duke faculty, a lot. It's, um, Crowsdale is run by the Methodist Retirement Home Corporation, so there are actually uh, quite a few retired Methodists, uh, re retired pastors, and um, they, you know, they did some good things. Uh, because in the 1960s, when the Surgeon General said, smoking is bad for your health, they quit. And so when they come to me and they say, you know, I've outlived my parents, I know why. They made early good decisions about their health, and it's made a difference for them. And they took their blood pressure medicine <laughs> when it was prescribed. And they did other things that were really important. Um, and the other thing that you would like to do, if possible, is to high, have high cognitive and physical functioning. And again, I think this starts with healthy habits. And um, you all have already done what you can do. Um, you know, one of the biggest things you can do to uh, enhance your cognitive aging is to get a lot of education. So everyone in this room already did that. You got a lot of education. You can't really do any more in that realm. But what you can do for both your body and your mind is you can exercise. And exercising da uh, really daily is what is recommended. And then finally, you, you know, what, what also is important is engaging with life, okay? So the people who are aging successfully are engaged in a variety of ways, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit this morning. Social activities, uh, productive activities, some of those work activities well into um, advanced years, religious life, and family life. And um, I was at uh, the retirement community with a small group of medical students yesterday, and um, we were in the nursing home. We were seeing some individuals who have a lot of impairments. One individual we saw in the nursing home, she was pointing to the picture of her mother on the wall. She was telling us it was actually her mother's birthday. Her mother's in her 90s now. And her mother is not in a nursing home. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so it was just an interesting juxtaposition there. Also, on the way out the door, the medical students got to meet one of my patients. She's not a, in the nursing home. She was working the front desk. So she works the front desk uh, five days a week. So the person who does that job can have a lunch break. So she's engaged in productive activities. She's engaged in family activities, religious activities. And she was very proud to tell the students that she was 95 years old and she took no prescription medicines. So I, I think that um, she made some good decisions too, but those didn't start when she was 95. Those good, good decisions, the relationships that she developed within her family, within her community, started 30, 40, 50. You know, they started a long, long time ago. She's reaping the benefits of that now. So I would, I'm encouraging you that 
uh, the good news is you're thinking about this now. And it's good that you are because life expectancy is getting longer and longer, okay? People who are born today can expect to live well into their 70s. But you know what the other good news is? Uh, there might be a, people, a few people in here who are 65 years of age right now, perhaps. And if you're 65 now, you've got, you can expect to live into your 80s, at least 20 years of life expectancy. <laughs> Is that good or bad? <laughs> um, I was telling the Duke, I was talking to some Duke undergraduate students and uh, this past week and I was telling them, I said, you guys, you need to plan to live 30 years after age 65. You need to plan to live that long. That's very likely what they will, unless we have problems. You know, life expectancy could be affected by things that are happening right now, unfortunately. We're having an obesity epidemic in this country, and so there are things that are happening that could change this, but um, I think in general, things are still improving, and I hope that continues. <laughs> But I am a geriatrician, and I can tell you that um, advanced years are often met by chronic illness. So illness changes as you get older. It's not an appendicitis that you go to the hospital and you get an operation and you're done with it. Uh, it is chronic disease. Chronic diseases like congestive heart failure, like hypertension, like diabetes, like dementia, things that don't go away, that have to be managed over time. And with these accumulating disability uh, illnesses comes, unfortunately, accumulating disability. And so this is something that we pay a lot of attention to. This is where I spend my time. I spend my time as a geriatrician with the older adults who are accumulating disease and accumulating disability. And I'm trying to help them accumulate the disease without accumulating the disability as much as possible, and there are ways to do that. Um, and then, oh, I just wanted to talk a minute about um, what we're just, what, what's going on here at Duke, because it's, you know, Duke is a very exciting place, and we do a lot of research. The Center for Aging has been around since the 1950s, and it brings a lot of, uh, researchers together from different disciplines. And right now, we just had a large grant funded by uh, the federal government to look at this idea of resilience. Uh, what is it, what is resilience and how can we foster resilience in older adult populations? And so person A has a lot of resilience, whatever that is, and stressors come along, and they're actually resistant to those stressors. They hardly have an impact on them. But person B is a little bit different, has less resilience, so stressors come along like trauma, disease, um, grief, a variety of stressors, and there is a downward trend for a while, but they recover from those things, and they continue to age on the normal spectrum of, of, of aging. But then there's person C who has very little resilience, and that person has a stressor, and they not only decline, but they never really recover uh, from that stressor. They're not resistant or resilient, and so these are the kinds of concepts that we're beginning to think about and really unpack. So what do we know about resilience? I'd say right now we know that um, physical exercise is the most important. Uh, these are some photographs from the National Geographic, 100-year-old individuals throughout the world. And um, I'm a little concerned about my aging because I'm not water skiing now or standing on my head despite my yoga. <laughs> so, but you know, this is something to uh, look, uh, you know, you have, we have to have a goal in mind, and so I would just encourage that exercise can do a lot for individuals, and it has so many benefits uh, that it's worth investing the time and energy in exercise and physical activity. So um, Dr. Seuss asked us to imagine aging like this, and for this poor guy, the outcome wasn't so good. Um, but let's reimagine that for a minute. Uh, we've talked about some things, and first, I'd like to say finding care is important. You may actually need care as you age, and maybe some of you in this room have been to these places that are marked on the world map, 
Um, these are the blue zones. And if you haven't visited them, maybe you're from them, that would be even better because these are the places in the world where people live the longest. And um, so researchers have begun to study these places in the world and it seems to have a lot to do with not just exercise but physical activity. These are places in the world where physical activity is part of daily life, where they have very good nutrition, where they have moderate alcohol use and they don't smoke. And so these are places in the world that we want to model ourselves after, visit frequently, <laughs> live there if you can. Um, and um, but remember that older age is a long time. It take, it's costly. Um, and you want to uh, be in a place where you're connected. I think that's really an important concept. And uh, you want to think about making it worthwhile. Uh, con how am I going to contribute, create, enjoy life? And so whether you're aging successfully or not successfully, I'm trying to find ways to help my patients think that it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile to be alive, and that can take a variety of forms. And then finally, um, I think we need to cultivate resilience, but I want to put one bug in your ear about cultivating adaptability. Um, I think that a lot of you are already cultivating adaptability because you're leaders, and leaders have to help people adapt, okay? And they have to be adaptable. So as leaders, you're cultivating adaptability. Adaptability is so important as we age because we're going to face it in one way or another. Um, and I think we need psychological, social, and physical adaptability. So think about that um, throughout the day and how you can cultivate that. And thank you. There'll be questions later, I believe. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Gene? Okay, is this working? Yes. Got it, guys. Good. Well, we're going to do the estate planning section now. And typically, when I do estate planning, it's your friend, the will, which, by the way, is fairly boring. What I'm going to do this time is spend a little differently. I'm going to talk more about what I, the estate planner, think is important in estate planning for myself. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm guessing. That is more relevant to the folks here than, than the vanilla version of Idgets, Gratz, and Cuperts and some of that stuff. Since we're talking about me, let me give you a little factual information just because that'll put some of the rest of it in some context. Uh, I'm 60. I'm a 1983 Duke Law graduate. I'm an equity partner in a real big law firm and have been an equity partner in another real big law firm for 26 years before the last two weeks when I changed firms. I was with Arthur Anderson before law school. I'm a CPA, remember Arthur Anderson, that'll come back up in a minute. My assets are probably highly typical to most professionals I see. I've got one hell of a big 401k, like we all do as I see professionals. I've been married for 39 years. I have two children. My daughter is an OBGYN in Florida. They aren't so good on tort caps. My son is graduating from college. Yes, he has a job. He will be off the payroll. He's moving to do investment banking with Barclays in New York. So the kids are just about out of the house. Yeah, I've been doing estate planning for 33 years since I graduated from Duke. And I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. I stayed in the area. And again, this is what matters to me. First and foremost in the what matters to me is think about yourself or think about myself in this particular case. We're all fairly notorious for doing a great job taking care of our clients, taking care of business, taking care of our families, our kids, our parents, have your choice. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about us, and we need to. We need to get our own house, for lack of a better term, in order. I can always tell when a lawyer's about to leave my law firm because they come scurrying in the door at that point to get me to do their will. Not that they couldn't have died in the last 30 years before that, but, you know, <laughs> The little rats come in for that last free shot at the will before they leave. I, I can almost tell the firm when they're going, <laughs> and have on occasion. So again, the point is, focus on you. You've you got to spend the time on yourself. Second in the land of what I really care about is pay attention to your own investments. I can tell you, I, I've made every mistake there is in that land. As a baby lawyer, I was really lucky. The big name investment guy in town who did all my rich clients did my account. Biggest mistake I made. I mean, it, it was the wrong choice in every direction on it, and I lost the 90s, so to speak. The next person I used for investments was a good friend. 
really bad mistake. At this point, and we've all done it. I mean, just, uh, we've done it. At this point, you know, I sit in those meetings with my clients. We're, we're vetting the big investment guys. Hey, I know who they chose. I was in the presentations. Got the objective one. So, you know, as you do it, pay attention on your own investment profile. Don't, don't just depend on it. Don't pick your friend. Do the one who helps you and make sure it all works together for your long-run advantage. Okay, next on the list of what I sort of care about, retirement and Social Security. Um, my, my big advice there is as you start making life decisions, pay some attention to the rules that are relevant, and the rules seem to bounce around at times. I can promise when you change law firms at age 60, early retirement just ain't on the radar screen. So I'm not focusing on how age 62 is going to play out on it. But seriously, as you look, the Social Security rules and some of the, the knee-jerk how you do it have changed. I'm by no means the expert on Social Security. But the point is, as it all becomes relevant, take a look, learn how it works. And, and to play it out in a little more detail, Social Security is one piece of it. But look at the elements of your own retirement package and make sure you understand the detail because the detail becomes key and, and they vary and it's, it's not cookie cutter or one size fits. It's very different across. My old law firm had a supplemental executive retirement plan, the SERP. We all knew about it. Well, quite frankly, it was a real fancy non-compete. You got to understand. The new firm has a defined benefit plan. Defined benefit, really? I haven't seen those in a while. I mean, just the trick is study the details of what is relevant to you as you're making the decisions to make sure you're putting your own package together correctly. Okay, next in my, my list of estate planning and personal prejudice, I suppose, is life insurance. If you need, and I mean need, life insurance, it's great. Educate, you know, get the kids grown, a term policy for 20 years, uh, spouse not, or, I mean, not working, have your choice. And life insurance is wonderful for those niche needs. The other side of it is you've got to have a life insurance to pay estate taxes. You know, by the time I pay estate taxes, I'm dead. <laughs> I really just am not going to lose too much sleep on that side. I got other money. I pay my own taxes. It's, it's essentially a gift to my kids, which is great. It's great estate planning if you want to do it as a gift. But the knee jerk, you've got to have it. Think through whether economically it makes sense. At the end of the day, if you have the funds for your needs, true needs, then it's an investment product. And make sure you consider it as part of your investment portfolio, but not the knee jerk, got to have it because you got to have it. It is, by the way, and Kay will attest, a great gift to give Duke University, law school, of course. <laughs> so keep an eye there on it. Okay, next in my personal, what I care about is asset protection. Asset protection these days is the secret thing we talk about in estate planning. You know, put the cone of silence around. We make sure the notes don't say asset protection. They say gift to the kids. But this truly is one of the issues that all professionals and power company executives kind of worry about. You remember Arthur Anderson a few minutes ago. I had a number of Arthur Anderson clients when the fall came. It was entertaining. I've had partners here with Jenkins Gilchrist in this day. So, you know, you, you got to know as a professional it's out there. You got to also know that there are a lot of young baby lawyers who are hungry these days. And if there's a car accident and we all have semi deep pockets, we're targets. So liability protection is big. You know, the, the litany I typically go down is the 401k is one of the best asset protection things out there in its own right because of the ERISA rules. IRAs have protection elements around them. You just got to keep them clean and staged correctly. Tenancy by the entireties. Property is great. In North Carolina, we do it on real estate. So your house, if its entirety is properties here, has some of the best creditor protection there is, except the IRS, but that's a different issue. Quite frankly, looking at that, when I look at my portfolio of assets, I paid off the house mortgage because my house is protected. My joint bank account with my husband is not. So, you know, it's not that I'm, I'm particularly worried there, but I'm just paying attention. If you're in Virginia, the personal property can be held as entireties, too. Again, asset protection. Another thing I've seen people do is at least be conscious of who owns title to assets. I've had some clients very aggressively, if they were concerned, shift the assets to the other spouse's name as a way to try to cushion off, if you will, from a creditor issue on it. 
With that said, the next call typically is, and by the way, we're divorcing. But, you know, once again, we're to a different issue. Make sure your notes, even if you go back and write it, you say, yeah, if you divorce, if. You can get very fancy with asset protection. You can do LLCs. You can do L uh, different kinds of trusts in Delaware and Alaska and some of these places. I even had a couple of clients do Nevis, the rock of choice in the Caribbean, if you want to hide assets, except they're a little shaky at the moment, so don't. But, you know, you can get fancy. You can go off the charts with it. But at least cognizance of your own shoring up of your assets is a good thing. And the other completely sideline advice I give clients constantly is pay attention to your umbrella policy. We sort of forget it, but, you know, the little umbrella sitting on top of your rest of your liability insurance is a good thing. The market used to be one or two, and it's dirt cheap. I mean, this stuff doesn't cost you anything. The market for folks like us now, or the, the standard, is pretty much $5 million. I, Normal portfolio, folks, professionals, tend to be at the five now, where it used to be the one and two. If you've got the asset best base to support it, $10 million is now in the market. So once again, it's just a little cheap way of taking care of yourself. Okay, continuing what I care about, contingency planning. Power of attorney, health care power of attorney, living will. Power of attorney is the durable power of attorney. Let someone else do financial kind of stuff for me, either as convenience, I'm traveling, or my husband is, in his case. Um, if there's an accident or something, I'm incompetent, it lets someone take over and do my business stuff for me. The alternative is a legal proceeding, whether you're declared in court to be incompetent and a guardian's appointed. I just don't want to go there. So power of attorney is useful. The most useful document to be, barring none, quite frankly, is a health care power of attorney. And the reason I say that is I had my dad's health care power of attorney for years. I never had a problem dealing with it, and it was after my mother died. That thing saved me more stress of being able to take care of stuff for him than anything on earth. Turn it around to myself. This document, which I have in place, will let my husband, which again would be easy, make a health care decision. But if something were ha to happen to him, I have two children. The hospital's going to be sitting there saying, which one of these two makes the decision to pull the plug on mom? Do I want the investment banker or the OBGYN? I get to pick. The hospital doesn't get to vote on it. The last is a living will. That's a preference item. But if it's something you feel strongly about, have it. Think about it. I'll tell you, it was one of the greatest comforts on earth when my dad was dying that I could, I had to sign things, but I knew to a moral certainty by his living will what he wanted. And when I signed, I never felt guilty about anything because I know my dad wasn't going to live the way he was living at that point. So those things to me are, are important to you. Next down the litany, I'm actually going to get to wills. You know, the will's part of the estate planning. I, it's not the top of my list because, once again, I'm dead by the time it counts. But the thing to think about in wills are don't, pick, don't do the cookie cutter. Don't, don't, you know, sneak your estate planning partner's document and do your own. Think about what matters and customize this document to something that truly takes care of yourself. My family... My son, 21, he can handle money better than anybody in this room, I can promise. He, he day trades on his phone and has since he was 16. He's good. William's money's going out right. There, there's none of this trust till he's 35, which is the knee-jerk reaction that my form has in it. My daughter, she's perfectly competent with money, but she's an OBGYN in Florida. Hers is tied up in trust until she's 65. Not that she needs a trust per se, but by setting it up in trust for her with me setting it up, she has the ultimate malpractice or asset protection thing that can be out there just because I'm leaving it that way to her with her little brother as trustee, different issue. Okay, that's wills. The rest of estate planning, title and beneficiary. Take a look at your assets and figure out how they pass. You know, that will really doesn't leave much of our property. The 401k goes by the beneficiary designation. The tenants by the entirety house goes by the deed to the survivor of the couple. Make sure you pay attention to beneficiaries and title to make sure stuff is going where you want it to go. Some of this has an overlay of income tax on it, and you want to make sure that you've done that in a way that is tax effective. Uh, the easy example there is a stretch IRA. I leave it to my son, who's 21. He can stretch that IRA over the next in your example, 70 years when he lives to 90. It's, it's a good way to do it. But make sure those beneficiaries and titles are lined up correctly. 
And by the way, if you're thinking charitable gift at all, the easiest, you don't have to mess around with it, you don't have to pay income tax, you avoid estate tax, is leave your IRA or 401k to the law school. It works really, really well, right, Kate? Absolutely. Yep, and turn it around. Important in my world was make sure my kids had all these documents I'm talking about. I dragged my kids in at 18 to sign those powers of attorney and health powers, make real sure I still control the assets. As each of them are moving out of state, I made them sign a North Carolina will because I could actually draft it, and I wasn't in the mood to draft Florida. So anyhow, to help us make sure as your children come of age that they're getting the proper stuff in place. I mean, you pray it'll never happen, that you'll have to deal with it, but if you do have to deal with it, make it easy for, for the deal with, for yourself, to have the stuff in your family. Next on my list of issues, funded living trusts. It's things that are talked about everywhere. The brokers push it. If you are in Florida, I understand Texas, California, by all means, fund a living trust. Their probate laws stink. If you were in North Carolina, frankly, I think funding a living trust is maybe more pain than it's worth, unless you're 85 with one account or something. So uh, don't go with the knee-jerk reaction about you've got to have a funded living trust. You know, everybody at the cocktail party has one. Look at your state law and look at your asset profile. Look at your active lifestyle and decide, is this a convenience? Is it an advantage? Or is it the broker just really gets off on funding living trusts because he confuses you and he keeps you as a client on it, which I think they do at times. Tax planning. And this will be the very quick. You can leave your spouse tax-free. You each have an exemption of about five and a half million, so a couple together can give can leave eleven million without estate taxes. If you're over the eleven million as a couple for five and a half, there are a lot of good fancy techniques that all involve gifting to try to get, essentially, gifting to try to get assets out of your estate and avoid estate tax. But back at square one, that's eleven million with a couple. Pay attention there. Do some basic tax planning, but decide what gets ridiculous at some point. You know, if your estate's $10 million and you got six kids, do you really want a generation skip and have all these trusts that are never going to be necessary under there, though the financial planners tend to push that stuff? Also, if you are, uh, the, the, most of the estate planning involves gifting, how aggressively do you want to gift? We're back to my square one. Take care of you before you make a bunch of gifts to save estate taxes, because if the couple has a $10 million estate, they don't need to be pushing themselves to, to save estate taxes. But back on gifting, if you want to get money to your kids, do it strategically. You can gift $14,000 a year to anybody without taxes. You do have the exemptions. So as you're thinking about helping your kids as they go forward, just think about the rules and do them strategically. Don't write the $100,000 check to them right off because you're going to have to do a gift tax return. You can split it over two years and a couple and a few other things, and you can get it in a way that doesn't trigger out the gift tax rules. You can also pay directly medical and tuition. So as you have grandkids and you really want to help your kids, let you pay directly the tuition to Duke University for that grandchild. It will be the greatest gift on earth to your children, and it is also outside the gift tax system. That's estate planning, my version. I think that's the 15 minutes on it. So uh, anyhow, we'll do questions at the end if y'all want to. Thank you. Mr. Mm -hmm. David. Morning. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about considering something to do on your way to retirement or in retirement, and that is transitioning your work to doing something different, and in particular uh, to thinking about working in legal aid or another form of uh, public interest work. Uh, I'm going to give you five reasons to think about doing that, and five concerns you might have about it, uh, but first, by way of context, I'll give you a little bit of background about me and what I did. I'm a member of class of 81, and uh, after doing a clerkship right after law school, I joined a law firm now known as Davis Wright Tremaine. Uh, it's a firm of about 550 lawyers in nine offices in U.S. and China, and uh, I was was in the Seattle office. Worked there for 30 years uh, doing primarily commercial litigation. 
Uh, and during that time, I was very fortunate in that I got the chance to work on a number of matters that were really meaningful and important to me. Um, in particular, I had a 20-year period where I spent uh, a large portion of my time working on the Exxon Valdez case. Uh, we were our, our part of a consortium of firms that represented essentially all of the businesses and individuals who were harmed by the spill. And it just meant a lot to me to, to work on that case and on some others. Um, but I reached a, a point where that went away and the other matters uh, wound down and I thought if I'm going to find the next meaningful and exciting thing to do, I might need to broaden my horizons and look for it someplace else. And so I started looking around uh, and uh, about three years ago uh, left to join Northwest Justice Project. Uh, we're the largest civil legal aid provider in Washington State uh, with about 135 lawyers in 17 offices around the state. I work in a small unit uh, that helps people who are experiencing foreclosures, homeowners and tenants. Um, and before making the move I had done some things to, to check it out. I had had experience over the years uh, uh, doing pro bono matters with a number of legal services organizations and also working with them uh, as a board member at an organization called Washington Appleseed. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Appleseed Network. Uh, so that gave me some exposure to the work, some exposure to the, to the people. And I also had some models with whom I consulted. I had, I knew a, a partner at a large Seattle firm who left to join NJP uh, some years before me and I sat down with him and said, how'd you make this work and what's it like? Um, I had a friend uh, from the Dickstein Shapiro firm who, when he retired, uh, spent uh, a few days a week uh, volunteering with the Legal Aid Society of D.C. Uh, handling public benefits matters. Uh, so I said, oh, okay, people can, people can do this thing. Uh, and for me, it's been a, a very good move. I've enjoyed it. Um, and it's, it's something for you to think about. So why might you... Uh, do something like this. I'm going to give you, as I said, five reasons. Uh, and the first, really, Heidi's already covered. Um, and that is that it is healthy for you to keep your mind engaged, to be engaged with life through doing something that, that is uh, uh, meaningful and, and of service. Uh, so there are many ways to do that, but doing this kind of work uh, is, is one of them. Um, second reason, if you've been doing the same thing for decades, you know, it's fun to shake things up uh, and just and try something different. It, it really is. It uh, gets the blood flowing. Um, third uh, is that uh, doing work that helps other people and that hopefully has a positive impact on the world is, is very fulfilling. Uh, just the other day, I, I read an article uh, by the, that uh, talked about the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen, which must be a pretty good place to work too, I would think. <laughs> um, and, and they had done, they had determined, they had found that the number one determinant of professional contentment is a sense of purpose. Um, in, in a similar vein, uh, I'm fond of quoting Albert Schweitzer, who once said, I think at a medical school commencement or something like that, he said, quote, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve, close quote. And if you do this kind of work, you will have a sense of purpose, you, uh, and you'll be happier for it. Uh, my, my guess is that many of you were motivated to practice law by a desire to help people and a desire to see the justice is done. Doing this kind of work will give you the opportunity to, to do those things. So I'll give you one example. Um, we've handled a number of situations in which people have been uh, scammed by uh, folks offering loan modification services. Well, we'll get your mortgage modified for you. Uh, all you have to do is pay us 
money up, uh, up front, and of course they don't do anything. Uh, even worse, uh, sometimes they say, congratulations, we did get your loan modified. Uh, you, your new lower uh, payment amount is X, and you can pay it directly to us. You don't even have to send it to the bank. Um, we, we've, had, uh, we've had some success getting money back for some of these folks and working with the FTC and the state attorney general. And, you know, it's, it's very gratifying to be able to help people who've been done wrong. Um, fourth reason um, that you might consider doing work like this is that the clients are very appreciative. Uh, I, I, had, I had good clients uh, in my 30 years at Davis Wright, but I guarantee you I have had more clients thank me for my work in the last three years than I did in the previous 30 years. I've had clients who've cried as they've talked about what a difference uh, we've made. I mean, we can't help everybody, but when we do, it's a really good thing. It's, it's very nice. Uh, and the fifth, um, fifth reason I want to give you to, uh, to consider doing this work is we need you. Um, according to a study a few years ago by the Legal Services Corporation, uh, the uh, approximately 20% of the legal needs of low-income people are served uh, with the assistance of a lawyer. So about four-fifths of, of these folks' legal needs don't get help from a lawyer. Um, the same study found that in among the general population, uh, the ratio of, of lawyers to the general population is about one in 400. Uh, by comparison, the ratio of legal aid lawyers to low-income people uh, defined as 125 percent of the poverty line or below is about 1 in 6,400. Uh, so the demand's a lot bigger than the supply. Uh, why does this matter? It matters because lawyers make a difference. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's not a surprise to you. Um, but something that, I, that I've seen firsthand on many occasions is that opposing parties and opposing lawyers behave differently when they think that there isn't going to be a lawyer on the other side to oppose them. Um, here's an example. We discovered that uh, a law firm in one county in Washington that was uh, filing unlawful detainer actions to evict uh, former homeowners and tenants. Uh, and they would file the action, walk down the hall to ex parte, and immediately get an order directing the sheriff to throw the person out of the home. No notice, no opportunity to be, to be heard, fundamental violation of due process. And some of these folks actually did have defenses. Um, and we found that in cases where we would come in to get the order undone, uh, the other side would immediately offer to settle. But in other cases where there was no lawyer, they would just keep doing the same thing. Uh, eventually, we wrote, we wrote a letter to the judges of the county and said, look, can't, can't do this. Uh, and, it, and it got the firm to, uh, to stop doing it. We've been monitoring cases since. Uh, so having a lawyer uh, makes a difference. Um, I tell people sometimes that, uh, that if someone doesn't have a lawyer to enforce their rights, it's not much different than not having rights. Um, you have great skills and experience to, to offer. Uh, and if you decide as, in, as part of your transition uh, to retirement uh, or as on a volunteer basis during retirement to, to use those skills, uh, you'll help other people, you'll make yourself happier too. Um, so something to think about. So I'm trying to imagine the questions going on in your mind about, are you, uh, really, can I, can I do this? Here, here, are the, here are five that came to, came to mind. Uh, you may say, can I afford it? Uh, my guess is probably you can. Call Jean, she'll, she'll <laughs> fig figure it out for you. 
Uh, my wife and I have been able to manage. I mean, we certainly consulted with financial planner as with anything. The earlier you, you start planning, the easier it's going to be. So when we walk out of here, please go find the members of the class of 11 and tell them to start thinking about this. Um, second, you may say, well, am I going to like this kind of work? It's, you know, it's very different than, than what I've done. And, and my suggestion is dip a toe in the water first. Uh, contact a legal aid organization, say, what do you got that I can do on a pro bono basis? And try it, see how you, see how you like it. Uh, third, you may ask, will I fit in culturally uh, with the organization? I mean, the, and the answer is probably yes. These are good, dedicated people that, uh, that you'll like being around, is my guess. Uh, fourth, what if I don't know anything about the substantive area of law? Uh, I can speak to this one because I knew not a thing about uh, foreclosures before I started doing this work. Um, had never done that, had done almost nothing related to real estate. And, and what I'll tell you is that you're smart people and you'll, and you'll get to learn it. I, I had a, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve uh, for a number of months. Uh, but I, you know, after a few years, I now feel like I know what I'm doing some reasonable percentage of the time. Uh, and again, it's fun to shake things up and, and learn something new. It, it, it helps to be humble. Uh, I found that I was often talking to, you know, people a lot younger than me and asking them to educate me about areas of the law I didn't know anything about. It's, it's, it was a little like being one half 30-year litigator and one half first-year associate. So it's an interesting combination, but it's, but it's fun. Uh, fifth, uh, can I do without the support staff? Um, <laughs> And, and my answer is yes. Um, you're, there's going to be more, odds are there's going to be uh, less support than you're used to, but more than you're imagining. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's going to be fine. I mean, those are some things that, that uh, came to mind. Uh, there may be others, so I thought I would stop and Peter can open Great. it up for questions for all of us or discussion. Let's do that. Who would uh, like to begin? Questions? <laughs> Yes. Peter, to make a couple of observations of something I just went through. My uh, father, who just passed away from Alzheimer's, we went through, our family went through seven years of the Alzheimer's descent. And just a couple of observations. From it. One is there's a total dearth of real support for families, people in their 40s, 50s, and it's going to start affecting people younger because younger people are getting Alzheimer's. I think it's a crisis in our society. The, the, the twin factors of not having good care, for an enough caretakers, and we ran into that, and then the problems for the generation that's trying to, just bewildering what, what we went through. And a couple specifics. One is long-term care insurance. It's one of the insurances I just wanted to supplement on your points, Gene. Uh, the, my dad had one of the first long-term care policies issued by John Hancock. It was unbelievable how that came into play and how that helped. The other is my dad's resistance to the power of attorney. And what we had to go through to get that power of attorney from, and if we hadn't, and just in the nick of time, because that, that dissent with dementia, it's such a tricky thing, and the senior's fighting for independence and doesn't want to give it up, and what we went through with that. So I just, just a couple of observations, really, about the whole Alzheimer's picture. And, so, and, and one other thing is just a question about Alzheimer's. What's happening at Duke in the search for the cure? <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh. Well, this is one of my favorite topics is dementia care and, um, you know, as a geriatrician, so neurologists, um, they like to diagnose it and psychiatrists diagnose, they deal with some behavior problems, but geriatricians and primary care physicians are the ones who care for these people over, as you said, long periods of time. And unfortunately, many primary care physicians have had very little training in how to take care of older adults with dementia. And geriatricians are not growing in numbers, we're shrinking in numbers. And mm -hmm. so it is not a wonderful outlook on a really incredible, pro it's an epidemic. It will be an epidemic. Numbers will triple in the next 30 years as far as how many older adults are living with cognitive impairment. 
and we're not ready for it. We're not ready for it on so many levels. It's not a, just a physician level. As you point out, caregivers, in-home caregivers are a hot commodity, um, and they're not very available, and there's not a lot of impetus for people to go into that very meaningful form of work. <laughs> it's a very meaningful form of work, and yet there's just not much impetus to get people trained and out into the workforce. Um, so our federal government is doing a few things to help with that, but not nearly enough. The Alzheimer's organization and the chapters that exist across the country are important um, points of information and care. Uh, I'll mention the Duke Family Support Program, which is a statewide program that provides um, information and access to resources and just really practical help that if you just Google Duke Family Support, you'll get, you'll get to that. But it is a huge issue and long-term, and, and mo a lot of people, I would assume people in this room understand that Medicare only covers medical needs. It doesn't cover care needs. Mm -hmm. And most care is custodial care. It is not medical care that is needed. It is companion care, someone to drive for you, go to the grocery store, make your meals, clean your house, and play games, you know, play bridge with you if, <laughs> if that's your game, whatever. Um, keep you doing things uh, in, in your day. That, those are, that's the important care that's needed, and that is not covered by Medicare or any health care supplemental insurance. And many families are surprised by that, and I have to deal with that all of the time. Uh, but long-term care insurance is one way to deal with that. Continuing care retirement communities are another form of long-term care insurance uh, because when you sign a contract, you are essentially, you're, you're investing in care for the rest of your life, but there's so many forms of contracts now, it's just mind-boggling. You might need an attorney to choose one, <laughs> one of those forms. But um, thinking about that kind of care, and, and you're right, um, it is the children who are not prepared, not informed, don't understand dementia, don't understand the spectrum of dementia, the early forms of dementia. And, and um, my own parents who are in their 70s, who uh, my father has mild cognitive impairment, but he still drives, he still does a lot of things. And my parents don't have that much cognitive impairment. And yet, they got the scammer, they get the scammer calls all the time all the time, and my mother called me in a panic. Where's Jonathan? I got a call from Jonathan. He's in the Dominican Republic, and he wants me to send him $5,000. Well, but she, my, um, my mother is still a little bit smart. She said, and my, he's a, a Davidson freshman. My mother happens to know there's this basketball player named Seth Curry who went to Davidson. We were talking about that over, over um, Christmas. And she said, Jonathan, who was that basketball player we were talking about over Christmas? If, you, if this is really you, Jonathan, you will know if, if this, who that basketball player was. And they, they hung up the phone after that. So, <laughs> so it, it, the scammers are intense. Please protect your parents. <laughs> uh, protect yourselves. Um, it, it's, uh, and, and begin to learn. And go to support groups. There are support groups for daughters and sons who are caring for older adults with dementia. And um, get on the internet and learn and get a diagnosis for your parents. So many people that sort of gets kind of pushed to the side and not clearly diagnosed. And a diagnosis is empowerment. It lets you go places and ask questions. And so dementia, I'm glad you brought it up. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> To your point, just a second ago, it's real easy to get the power of attorney signed when someone's healthy and 65. Once you got an issue there, people don't want to let go. So having it on the shelf is great. Excuse me. Is there some directory online like a licensing board for geriatric physicians? When, you know, my physician I've worked with for 20 years is the same age I am. So he's going to be retiring. And then uh, how do you find out a qualify, who might be qualified, especially in the non-metro areas? 
Very few people are qualified in geriatric medicine. Um, and most of them are working in academic healthcare centers. So I would say wherever you live, the biggest city, you call the School of Medicine and you find out who the geriatricians are. And most of them are associated with um, hospital systems because geriatricians um, can't make much of a living. They make less than family medicine doctors and internists. Uh, so they're not in private practice for the most part. Um, and it, they need health systems to support the kind of work that we do, which is very time intensive. Uh, and so that's part of why you can't find geriatricians very easily. Um, and, but there are also geriatric nurse practitioners and physician assistants and people like that out there. And um, so older, some older physicians, older than me, grandfathered into the, uh, into the specialty before fellowships became plentiful. Um, but it is, I'm telling you, it is, it's a crisis. Half of our geriatric medicine fellowships go unfilled every year, unfilled, because there is not, there is not uh, an economic reason to go into geriatric medicine. It is only altruism that will bring you into geriatric medicine. So um, we need to fix this problem. <laughs> Yes. Dr. White, do you have an opinion about whether or not the aging population ought to uh, do those genetic studies of themselves, you know, to understand <clears throat> what proclivities you might have? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, I think there's a variety of genetic, uh, there are a lot of companies out there offering a variety of things. So some of them, it's relatively harmless because you're finding out kind of where you're from in the world, you, you know, whether you're from, you know, what your, what your genealogy is, essentially. And so that kind of genetic information is relatively harmless. But one of my, one of my, I, I, I can't say I know a lot about this, but one of my patients brought me some paperwork she wanted. Her daughter had gotten some genetic testing done. And now the company was saying for some reason she could get free genetic testing to complement her her daughter's genetic testing, which of course she felt compelled to do for her daughter, but I was wondering what, how, what was the back end of this and what were they trying to get her to do? And I said, you know, most major medical centers like Duke have uh, genetic counselors so that are not connected with <laughs> these companies that provide genetic testing. If you're going to get that kind of genetic testing, I would say you need to also invest in getting genetic counseling to help you with figuring out what you're going to do with the results of that genetic testing. Um, you know, be, because it, there's, there's a lot of information you can have, but what you can actually do with it. So Alzheimer's disease is a, is a we know here from Duke, APOE, APOE4 was dis discovered here at Duke. Uh, Dr. Roses, Alan Roses, was behind the discovery of APOE4. APOE4 predisposes you to, to Alzheimer's disease. If you, you can either have one APOE4 or two APOE4s. If you have two APOE4s, that's worse than one, of course. Um, but it, it doesn't tell you whether or not you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. There are many people who have two APOE4s who never get Alzheimer's disease. There are environmental factors. There are things that we still don't understand about Alzheimer's disease. There has been, you know, it, look, about, look at two disease processes. We have HIV and we have dementia. We have Alzheimer's disease. A lot of money was invested in HIV. And we have made amazing progress. A lot of money has been invested in Alzheimer's disease, and we've made hardly any process, progress. And we haven't progressed in the most important area, what you mentioned, the care for this army of individuals that's going to need it. How do we care best for them? How do we make their lives worth living? It's going to be important. It's going to be important to all of us. It's going to be important that our parents feel that Moving into this process is not something they need to be deathly afraid of. 
that we're going to care for them and we're gonna learn how to do that really, really well. And so I think it's really important not only to invest in cure, I hope we find a cure, but we have to invest in care. And that's not what we're doing well enough, in my opinion. But I don't know if I answered your question because I don't know enough about these genetic testing yeah, yeah, companies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm leery of them. That's helpful. <laughs> I may be <clears throat> totally off base, but it would seem to me that if you had some of this genetic testing done and it revealed um, uh, either a disease or, um, or the preponderance, I guess, I mean, the um, of possibility to have the disease, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about it, but I, that might be something you, you, um, your health insurer might feel like you needed to reveal, and that could be a big issue. If, if you yeah, that's what, what. Well, that's how I counsel. Uh, often how I counsel the children of my patients that I mean, we could do APOE four testing. It. It is. I, if it would be important to do APOE4 testing, if I could offer you a preventative measure to help you prevent this disease, and I don't have a preventative measure to help you stave off Alzheimer's disease, it's information that, in my opinion, can only hurt you. It doesn't help you very much, and so uh, you have to be cautious about these things. Um, so some people really want to know, and you can find out, uh, but. What are you going to do with that information? And that's where the genetic counseling comes in to help you deal with the information that you have and the lack of cure <laughs> that we have. You know, we don't have a cure. And you can go ahead and plan financially as if you're going to have dementia, <laughs> okay? You can go ahead and do that. Nothing's stopping you from doing that now. You should. It's an extremely expensive disease to have. His father, she had a, um, a long-term disability policy, um, a long-term care policy through John Hancock, which I'm not trying to promote John Hancock, but it was fabulous. And very few people have those policies. And so I insisted to my husband that, as her daughter, I have a long-term care policy. He, he was, I am wasting my money here. I said, well, if it happens, you'll be happy that you have it. All right, one last question uh, in the back. Yes. This is a question for Jean. You mentioned that when your children went off, left North Carolina, I guess, right. went off to college or after college, that you had them sign a bunch of papers. I had not focused on that aspect at all, and I just wanted to make sure I understood. What do you think a child turning 18 ought to sign or think about? Right. What I absolutely think they need is a health care power of attorney. The 18-year-old is a legal adult. And mama here doesn't have the right to make a health care decision for him immediately. So I made sure both kids signed their health care power of attorney. I also had them sign a financial power of attorney, quite frankly, just because it was life easier for me to be able to handle their accounts. Not that I was playing any games there, but that was a life easier for me kind of thing. Um, living will, I discussed it and let them consider it. I see the kids today have a real mixed reaction on that, and also anatomical gift. The kids really have a mixed reaction on that sort of thing, but I at least put it on the table to them. The will was actually the least of my concerns. The only reason I had them do it is they literally were going out of state, and I knew I could do a North Carolina, which isn't the greatest thing with the cross-state business, but I could tag them before I had to deal with it someplace else. But their accounts, you know, intestacy wasn't going to be that bad a disaster for us, Title and stuff, it wasn't a disaster, but yeah, I mean, that'd be my last choice of the group. Healthcare is worth its weight in gold in every, every way on earth. All right, well, thank you. Hopefully, you found it productive. I appreciate it. That was very interesting on it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I got Thanks. my plug in for the charitable giving. <laughs> No, my job when I speak on the state plan. You always hit the charity.